Please join me for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome to the February 22nd, 2016 Selectman's Meeting. First tonight we're going to have a public hearing on impacts and secondary effects of Aquarian Water Company's petition for monthly billing for water. Uh, Carl McMorrin is here from the um, Aquarian Water Company and perhaps others also. And uh, I expect, uh, Carl, can you explain to us what that's all about? Yeah, we'd be happy to. Please, Please join us. There's another chair right over there. As I hope you'll know, I'm Carl McMoran, Operations Manager for Aquarium Water Company in New Hampshire here in town. And, uh, with me tonight is Deb Kirvin. She's our Director of Rates and Regulation, and McKinley Rowe, who also works in the Rates and Regulation uh, Department. So we appreciate the opportunity just to, uh, to speak to our proposal, which is to to uh, switch our customers who are currently billed uh, quarterly for uh, fire service and, uh, and all of our um, other residential uh, metered customers. Um, so everybody's going to go to monthly billing except for the public fire protection uh, customers. And really the, uh, the, the current quarterly billing uh, cycle, it's a relic from the, the, the good old days, so to speak, when it just wasn't cost effective to try and get meter readings on a monthly basis uh, or, to, or to send them out. Uh, we're actually probably the last holdover of utilities that don't currently bill uh, on a monthly basis. Um, and we've actually had a fraction of our customers uh, already being billed monthly for some years, and that's our, our larger commercial customers and our seasonal uh, customers. So uh, we're doing this. We think it's going to provide some, some benefits uh, to all of our customers as well as, as to the company. Uh, for our individual customers, uh, the monthly bills will allow them to make, a, I think, a better comparison of their water utilities or their water bills to other utilities and uh, other monthly services like cable, internet, whatever, as well as just regular household expenses. So we think it's going to give them better predictability and hopefully be more useful to them uh, in their household budgets. One of the really big benefits is a better control over leaks. Uh, right now with quarterly billing, somebody could have a leaking toilet. It could literally run for months. Uh, and then they get the shock of a big bill when it's finally read. Um, so it's going to cut that down. If there is a leak, in theory, it shouldn't run more than a few weeks. So it's going to reduce the, the amount of uh, lost, unused water and, uh, and reduce that, uh, that shock of a high bill and also the leak adjustment that sometimes uh, goes along with that. And, um, <clears throat> So we also uh, hope that smaller, more frequent bills will make it easier for customers to stay current, cut down on the, the uh, number of past due invoices uh, that occur. For us as a water company, it's going to provide uh, better operating accounting for the water because uh, we can synchronize the meter consumption volumes with our other production calculations. Uh, it'll help promote conservation because the more frequent usage data um, will help send a price signal. Um, to the customers. Uh, it'll also provide more detailed information to our customer service um, staff. So when a customer calls up with questions about why their bill's high or low or whatever, it's uh, better and more detailed information. Uh, there will be some increased costs due to printing and postage, but we think these are going to be offset um, because of the advantages of uh, what the technology gives us to read meters. Uh, basically a greater volume or the same or, the, or, or less amount of labor. Um, and it can also be reduced if we can get more customers to shift over to our uh, e-billing program, which will enable postage altogether. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Deb to speak to a, a couple of the uh, accounting level uh, questions. Um, there were some items, the past due uh, charges. The company is requesting that the the bills we paid within the 25 days because of the monthly cycle, we don't want a customer to get uh, their next bill with a past due amount. Um, and so they're looking at two months worth of billing. So if they pay within 25, 
our system can get um, it all paid off in the and by the time the next bill comes out it'll be a zero carry forward balance but with that we won't be charging the late charges until 30 days after so it's not that we're going to be charging 25 days a late charge it's 30 days is the late charge but we are requesting that customers pay the bill within 25 days just for our billing system um, there was also a question on the 5% um, uh, late fee uh, and it, we believe the question was uh, if it's going to be compounded and would that mean that it's more of a charge to the customer the answer to that is no the um, the bill the charge is on the current month so for example with the quarterly if you have a $45 quarterly bill and you're late, you'll get a 5% charge, which is $2.25. With the monthly bills, let's say you have three consistent consecutive months of $5, or sorry, $15, that's $45 and a quarter as well. The first month, you'll have $15 outstanding. If you're late on that payment, it's 5%, so it's 75 cents. The next bill that comes out is again $15, the charge, the 5%, is only on that current bill, $15. So again, a $0.75. Cents. Third month, same thing. If you have the, you, you're late on that bill, it's $15, the current bill. And again, $0.75, cents, totaling to the $2.25. So it's not a cumulative amount. It doesn't compound. So that was one of the um, questions that we had. There was also... Um, our working capital. We'll try and explain the working capital um, uh, information that we requested. Uh, right now, uh, we are billing the customers uh, in advance for service charges, and what we want to do is change that to in arrears. And what that means is we will not be charging the customer until after the usage. So right now, 45 days, a quarter, sorry, a quarter, 90 days, we're charging them, let's say where the bill is July 1st, we're charging them for July, August, and September service charges on July 1st. What we're going to be doing is switching that so that we will not charge for July's service charges until August 1st. So we're going to be less cash in the door so the working capital, how that works with the, the rate case, the working capital, the lead lag study that was done in the rate case, we're missing out on cash coming in. So we have to make up for that with um, the lead lag study that was in there. And so there's a, what's it called? I'm missing the word now. Hmm. It's an adjustment in um, that goes through with the rate case. So right now, we're not going to be in for a rate case, right. So we're, we're deferring that um, adjustment for the lead lag in the working capital and amount. That's what we're asking for. Defer that until the next rate case when we can ask the um, commission to handle that. That was it. So at this point, we put in our petition a target date of May 1st uh, to go. Uh, go forward with monthly billing. That's contingent upon the Public Utilities Commission approval of that. And part of the reason for this timing is to get this in place as we get into the summer peak demand period, um, when people start using a lot more water. Um, a little bit indoors, but a lot outdoors. Uh, so it'll be useful to people who really want to uh, try and manage their summer water consumption uh, in order to optimize their bill. But uh, once this date is confirmed, whether it's May 1st or if it, if it should be put off, uh, we will mail a letter to every customer, um, yeah. even those that are currently on a monthly cycle, as well as um, publicize it through other other media as well. You're welcome. So, uh, I guess in sum, I just say this is uh, this change is part of our continuing efforts uh, to improve delivery of safe and reliable water service uh, to all of our customers, and. Uh, they all receive 24-7 uh, delivery of all the water they need. It's literally at their, their fingertips uh, at uh, substantially less than a penny a gallon. So thanks for this time. Uh, if the board pleases, we'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, first, we're going to go to Mr. Welch. 
Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> thanks for coming. Appreciate well, it. Uh, I was confused when I read your opening letter to the uh, Public Utilities Commission because the opening letter said that the public fire charge, that is the fire hydrants, we put it down to that, um, was, the billing for that was not going to change. Correct. And then I, when I read the rate proposal, it says that, yes, it will change, and the first payment will be due in t January 2017 instead of January 2016 and J July 2016. And now I read the, the notice that came out today, and it's changed again. What's the payment frequency going to be? And when, when will our charges for 2016 be billed, I guess, is the question. The, the frequency is uh, six months, but what is changing for the billing is going from in advance to in arrears. Yeah, so, that I'm familiar with. Yeah. Uh, so because the last bill that you did receive billed you in advance, yeah. then you're already paid up, and now we're not going to charge you until in arrears, so we're not going to charge you until after the fact. So let's say January 1st bill, you're already paid up until January, July 1st. And then we're not going to charge you for July, August, September, October, November, December until January 1. So you're not going to get the bill until January 1. Okay. That's, that's what I had understood from the final piece of paper I received. I have a problem with that. The town has just appropriated half a million dollars, which has to be raised from taxes, although you're not going to send us a bill for the whole year. It's going to be billed in 2017. So I'm taxing the citizens of this town for half a million dollars they don't need to pay. And I have no choice but to tax them for that, even though you're not going to bill us. So I think that's an objection we need to file with the Public Utilities Commission. Your first letter said there'd be no change. And, and we relied upon that. You didn't tell us that you were going to do these changes until after um, the final due date for uh, appropriations for the town. So that half a billion dollars means a lot of money to the citizens of this town. That's something that shouldn't be on the tax rate at this point. Um, that's just for your observation and, and for your information. Um, that's going to, I'm sure it's going to cause a problem with someone. Uh, the other thing I had was when I read this, uh, your letter and I read your, your, uh, your, your proposed rate, uh, I understand your explanation about the due dates and how you're changing that from 30 to 25. Um, I didn't see anything there in there that says that you're not going to charge interest until 30 days. It just says you're going to charge interest after the due date. And I think you need to amend your filing if that's what you're going to do, because otherwise you can say it, but in fact you can change it later and start charging it 20, on the 25th day or the 26th day. Uh, it, it, the, there's the, claim, the claim isn't there in the documents we've received. I understand your explanation, but uh, I think you need to put it in the, in the PUC document to make sure it's actually in the rate itself so there's no misunderstanding. And I had understood you to say there's no compounding. If you miss one, month one, you're going to receive one 5% charge if you're late. And uh, that doesn't compound in a month two. Month two stands alone. Month three stands alone. Month four, stand, whatever it is, stands alone. Is that is that correct? It's not going to pancake one to the other? Compound. Correct. Okay. Um, what's not... We didn't know this. It was not on the, the record yet. It, we had uh, data requests yep. from the PUC, and we answered those data requests on February 9th. They are not part of the public record yet, um, but that was one of the questions, data requests, that PUC had for us, that um, it says payable within 25 days with the, the penalty, and we explained to them on that. So it will be part of the record where it specifically says we're asking for payment within 25 days. <clears throat> the penalty will not be charged until the 30th day. I, I understand what you're asking for. My, my concern is that's not what's in the rate structure. It needs to be in the rate structure specifically that says you're asking for payment within 25 days, but penalties will not be assessed until the 30th day if the, pay, if the bill is not paid. If it's not stated that way in the rate, you're perfectly free to charge the interest on the 25th day. And there's nothing the Public Utilities Commission or anybody else can do about it once the rate's approved. Okay. I'm just suggesting that you need to put a clarifier in. It is. Um, with the data requests, we filed the tariff page. And on the tariff page, the adjusted tariff page, it says um, a penalty of 5% will be added to the bills which are unpaid 30 days from the postmark date of the bill. Okay. So it was corrected. It's just not part of the record yet. And I, we tried to figure that out and find out what how we could get it part of the record. 
Well, you need to put it in the rate itself. That's they need to approve it in the rate itself, and that's that's mm -hmm. principally our concern is that needs to be there, right? So, so that people understand it. it. It's in in the adjusted tariff pages yeah. that we did for the data request. Okay. It's there. It's just not in the record yet, and it hasn't been received officially. Okay. So we want to make sure it is. I think that's our that's our request. So, mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Waddell. Uh, no, I think Fred answered the, you know exactly the questions I had They've done the 25 days and stuff. And the other thing, the only thing that I have is, you know, has the public been notified yet? We have not put anything official out yet. Yeah, so they're not going to be notified until after it's in effect? Um, no, once it's approved, <clears throat> if we get approval on March 1st, then we'll have enough time to do our IT, um, uh, you know, rescheduling or... or um, but what I'm saying is, after it's approved, they'll be notified. Correct. So but not prior would be, you know, do, do they have do they have the opportunity to, to put input in prior to it being approved by the uh, commission? That's what I was hearing. The question was. Yeah, it's a little bit of a challenge to decide how to do that. I've, I mean, I've mentioned it in various meetings for uh, middle of last year. We don't want to go out and say, oh, we're going to a monthly meeting and then have it not be approved by the PUC, and now you know, people are going to be confused. So it's, you know, you've got a point. People should know ahead of time, but, you know, some, some level, you don't want to let them know until it's reasonably official. So we're getting close to that in the process now. I, I don't think that was the reason for the question, if I can interrupt. And that is citizens don't have an opportunity, opportunity to comment to, to the Public Utilities Commission if you don't tell them until after the approval is done. That's the that's I think that's the reason for the question. Yeah. Should there be a hearing, and if people this this meeting will determine whether or not the board recommends there be a hearing. If there is one, then people should be notified of it so they can bring testimony forward as to whether or not they do or don't. Yeah. Well, that's why we're here tonight. We appreciate right. the opportunity because it's the point in the process where we we're trying to get more information out to, to the public. I'm going to go to the um, Mark some comments sure um, regarding your rate uh, and the effect on uh, the on the rates that are addressed in the petition under paragraphs seven and eight this is on page three the petition for monthly billing itself um, in one sense you're indicating that the uh, going from quarterly to monthly reduces your working capital allowance by 113 basis points on the other hand changing the service charges uh, from in advance to in, in arrears um, increases the working capital allowance by a larger number of basis points. Can you explain for the public what that means? Um, I explained before with the opening statements um, as far as the working capital, um, the percentage of going from in advance to in arrears. Um, so uh, that reduces your working capital? Is that what you're saying? We need to get um, recovery with that working <clears throat> capital, right? Yeah. yeah, so the whole point of the working capital uh, in a rate-making standpoint is to fund our operations. So we, we put out a bunch of money to fund our, fund our operations. We need to get that money back plus a return. It's part of the rate-making process. So what is happening when, when, when we're changing our rates, there's two things that's, that's happening. One, we're switching from quarterly to monthly. So we need to assess how that impacts our working capital. Going from quarterly to monthly, we're getting that cash flow in sooner. So in essence, that's where you see where the working capital reduces. Then we're switching from an advance where we're getting, getting that cash flow sooner again. Now we're getting it in a rare. So now we're, we have provided the service and incur the cost, now we're, we're recapturing that money from our rate payers. So there, there is a, a lag between when money goes out the door, when money comes in, and what's really driving the, uh, the working capital percentage up is switching from in advance to in arrears. So with those two uh, components, though, the net of it is, a, is an increase to working capital. But the, the, the point that, that, that kind of needs to be made is that the working capital is, ha is not having an impact on, on this whole petition. It's just part of what we're doing and, and to be made whole. So we're asking PUC to consider that in our petition to defer those costs 
for a later day. And, and so what you're trying to do, as you've said, is to, for a, it, the, you're talking about for a limited period of time, right. that so-called lead lag time, that's the period of time that you'll be seeking to recover for the loss of working capital? Yeah. Well, if, let me put it this way. If we have this process and in effect at the time of our rate case, our working capital would have been the 14% that we, we were asking for now instead of the, I think it's 8%. So in, in, in essence, because we're not changing our rates, we're saying, okay, if we did this back then, this is what our working capital would have been. So we're just asking for the difference to defer that for our next rate case. And the fact that we're asking for a deferral, it's just something that's going to sit on our, our balance sheet. And whether we're whether the PUC approves it or not, that's up for up to up for discussion in the next rate case. And so the amount that you uh, the the quantification of the difference between those basis points amounts to twenty three thousand one hundred and sixty nine dollars. Did I get that right? I believe that's correct. Yes. And and that's the amount that you'll be seeking to have the PUC allow you to raise your rate. For that amount, so that you'll recover what you lost, is that basically that I get that right? It will be considered in our next rate case if the, if PUC does, decides to allow us to defer those funds. That that would be the theory, though. You'd be asking the PUC to allow a rate increase to cover that amount. Well, it, it, it was depending on the rate making approach that they use. It's, uh, I mean, I, I don't know how it will flow into the rate making. Process. However, yes, we are asking asking the PUC to allow us to defer those funds for um, consideration in the future. And and that next rate case is anticipated to be when? We don't have a next rate case scheduled yet. Not scheduled, but when is it anticipated for? We don't have a date. No idea. We don't have an, an anticipated date. Um, the other question I had was you're going uh, from quarterly to monthly for uh, metered customers and private fire. Metered includes both seasonal and uh, regular? Seasonal is already monthly. Okay. And the only change then for the seasonal would be that it will be in arrears. They'll go to in arrears as well? No. no. Seasonal with the service charge, they're full seasonal service charge is charged one time at the beginning of the year, beginning of the season. And we stated that. The only one that will not go in arrears on the service charge is are the seasonals. At one time, the company in its rate case, the last rate case, uh, advanced the idea of having inclining blocks of service in which some categories of customers might be charged differently from others. And the company does, in fact, do inclining blocks of service in other states. I believe Connecticut you do. Is that right? Um, we're here for the monthly billing. I, I don't. I didn't know how this might impact that, uh, that practice because I think you've got that implemented in other states, perhaps Massachusetts. Uh, do you know that one, Carl? No? Uh, no, I don't. But, um, at this point, it's just a flat biometric rate. What may come out of a future rate case, who knows at this point. Okay. Rusty? Well, first of all, thank you guys for coming in. Um, I think it, it, every time we can get this out, the public knows a little bit about it and they can answer questions. Um, I haven't got any at this time, but. Okay, and Mr. Bean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Fred, we went up and testified, or we tried to, uh, at the PUC. Is that correct? Yes. Weren't there a bunch of young lawyers that uh, There were always a bunch of young lawyers. <laughs> they, they, look, they look pretty green, but um, uh, you guys can say whatever you want when you come to our meetings here, and I know you appreciate that. I don't call you a resident. But uh, I find it extremely annoying when I travel to Concord to represent people that elect me in the United States of America and in this town. And then your company uh, stands up lawyers 
and prohibits me from speaking. So I'd just like to hear your comment on that right off the bat, because you take the time to serve, you take the time to drive the Concord, and uh, your company won't let an elected representative from Hampton speak. So I'd like to address that, because um, at the end of the day, that's where this all goes. Carl? <clears throat> to be honest, I don't think I have a, an answer for that. All I can do is take it back to um, our corporate people and let them know about your dissatisfaction and try and accommodate those those concerns in future rate cases. Yeah, I think that's fair. I really do. Because you as a uh, Hampton resident, you can come in here anytime you want and talk. We're not going to have a pack of lawyers to say you can't talk. Uh, I like your company a lot. I didn't like that particular evolution up in Concord. But, um, you know, we're all big boys and girls. We'll get over it. Uh, you say on page four, number 13, that this will not uh, result in your company collecting more revenues. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. It's just spreading the, the expense out across months instead of quarters. Okay, thanks. Uh, claim benefits, you say it promotes uh, conversion resulting from more frequent price signals by going from quarterly to monthly. What does that mean? Um, well, as Mark indicated, some um, some utilities, particularly California, is a good example. They use higher prices for higher volumes to try and, and uh, encourage conservation. Um, it's been brought up in previous rate cases, and it was determined that because of the quarterly bills, it just doesn't send that information frequently enough or accurately enough to be effective enough. So it, it does open that as, as a potential t tool in the future. Um, as um, something that could be used to try and meet conservation policies in the state. Gotcha. Um, higher rates will not result, correct? Not from this, no. Okay. Uh, you're not going to collect more revenue from the, from customers? Um, it allows you to monitor uses more closely, and as, as you say, if I have a leak, uh, you'll be able to send me a letter or a call, or so oh, one, one of the guys will stop by. follow up on those. Uh, yeah, 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 and you do a good job on that. We appreciate it. Um, and it provides more information for you to respond to the customer inquiries? Yes. Um, again, the leak issue uh, allows the company to reduce uh, unaccounted for water. What does that mean? Uh, well, we don't use the term unaccounted for water. We have uh, lost water. Um, it's basically the difference between uh, what we produce, what we measure in our production meters, and what is measured through the meters in all of our our homes and our, and our businesses. And there's a difference because no water system is perfectly tight. Uh, so there's certain standards that we try and, and meet in terms of reducing that, that uh, lost water. And, um, so obviously the accuracy of having metered consumption is a big part of that. We, at this point we see probably three quarters of our, of our volume is, uh, is metered. Um, but there's a little bit of an estimate in there because uh, our production numbers don't align time-wise with when we're reading our meters. Um, so by doing it monthly, we can get a closer alignment between what we're producing, what's what's going through customer meters. It gives us more insight, better insight into what the difference is and how we can try and control it. Great. Uh, you say on page 3H, uh, provides greater predictability and budget and control to customers as you've transitioned from quarterly to, to monthly uh, in other towns, in other municipalities you provide water to. Um, give an example or a percentage or talk to that issue. It's a generic statement. Yeah, we haven't done it in New Hampshire. Do you have any info from Connecticut? Um, can you repeat that? Just yeah, it, this is out of your testimony. Yeah, page um, three. And it says that it provides greater predictability and budgeting control to customers, and that's a generic statement. And I wanted to know, you know specifically um, if, if uh, the, the bridal household um, uh, or how many households call you and actually or communicate with you via email or telephone or service that uh, it actually improves their budgeting and uh, their control of their water. Is that a, what is that phenomenon? Well, the only thing I can speak to is my own personal experience. Uh, prior to coming to New Hampshire, I lived in a system. We had monthly billing, and, and my wife, who is the home accountant, um, <clears throat> handled that. Uh, here, going back quarterly, it's a little bit more work for it to keep track of things that aren't occurring every month and lining up with you know our other monthly bills. Um, it's just 
it's really uh, the ability to compare apples to apples uh, if you're trying to you know, manage your household budget. Okay. So we think it's a benefit to have that on a monthly basis. Thank you, Carl. And then how many other municipalities in New Hampshire do you folks uh, produce water for? We serve Hampton, Northampton, portion of Rye. There's testimony in uh, here that uh, Esquire was provided that Northampton uh, was uh, enthusiastic about going to monthly billing. Yes, they've been uh, Is that true? proponents of that. Mm -hmm. And so that they've been satisfied and they were enthusiastic about it. That was testimony that is in here. Yes, they've been. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, I think uh, Mr. Welch has raised uh, uh, some great issues in terms of uh, the municipal side of the house. Uh, Esquire has done as well. And I would, uh, I would compel you, uh, as uh, uh, people approve Friday, uh, a product to Hampton, that when uh, Hampton elected officials go to Concord, it's a matter of custom and it's a matter of grace that uh, elected officials are allowed to speak. And uh, I'd be interested in a, a phone call from Chuck on that. Um, it is early as convenience. And we'll pass okay. that on to Thank him. you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, and I would just, uh, well, I'd like to know if there is a leak, where do you have a leak that you wouldn't know about? Um, you know, leaking toilets tends to be the biggest culprit. So you're talking about a, a leak like that? Yep, it's um, things that, you know, it's water that's going through the meter and it's getting getting away um, unbeknownst to the, to the customer. Um, we've had examples that's been outside faucets, irrigation systems, swimming pools, if they have those connections. Toilets tend to be the big big culprit, even leaking faucets if they're just dripping. Mm -hmm. can waste an awful lot of water without people being being aware of it. And, uh, the service line in the culture. Yeah, sometimes. But we, uh, in the last three years, we've had uh, 60 uh, instances where it's been high enough that we've actually offered a leak adjustment. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, it happens, and it's, and believe me, it's statistically, it's unlikely to happen to any of us. But if you're the person who went on vacation and something was was running, you get back two weeks, and then three months later you get this, you know, $500 water bill. It's ten times what it normally is. It's like, you know, you're upset, and uh, so it's a waste of water. It's a waste of ratepayers' money. Um, it's just something that allows us to control that better. Yeah, I guess I haven't had any leaks like that <coughs> over the last 50 years. Keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> Maybe I I'm build lucky. one for eight thousand dollars worth of leaks. And um, I, I don't like about the five percent um, charge uh, for the late charge. And in fact, actually, I prefer it just the way it is now. I prefer, I would rather be billed every three months, and I find it an inconvenience to be billed every month myself. Rusty, just one of those leaks you talk about. I know at our church we had one last year over on High Street, you know, it broke under the building and we didn't do it. I have a question for you. You talked about your e-bill payers. Do you charge a fee if somebody uses a e-check or a credit card? I, I, I purchase water in another community um, and I pay by, by email or e-check and they charge a $2.50 fee just be able to do that. Is that something you guys do or not? Do you know, can you answer that? I know that um, sometimes it's the uh, bank that charges you that charge and not the water company. Um, as far as the e-billing, um, the e-billing is the bill going out, so it's just an email to your um, uh, email account. The payment, the payment back, um, that's usually done through a separate um, company. So um, I'm trying to think, Mon Monavane. Um, those are the people that charge you the fees. Okay. It's not really the, the water company. All right. This one's a community. The community owns a water <coughs> system, and, and the community itself just decided, they did this last year, that before you used to pay it, you used to pay it, and now you have to pay this fee. And I was just curious to see if that's what you, what you guys did. That's all. I guess the answer is it depends on what service you're using. You yeah. Actually Maybe pay your bill. Okay. Yeah. So what if the people that live in Hampton want to call up and pay the bill over the phone, um, like I do sometimes with um, the electric company? And how does that work? Do you, are they charged extra? 
Uh, I don't know the charges that are there. We can we can find out all the different. Yeah, because I think that's a big thing mm -hmm. um, that people should know because there is no charge at the electric company, or at least as far as I know. Mr. Waddell. Yeah, I just want to say that you know I agree with the monthly billing. I think because I once had an apartment building that an elderly lady didn't in Massachusetts didn't tell me that it was leaking toilet, and I had a pretty large bill, awful large. Uh, and I agree, you know, with the, with the monthly and that. I just want to just reiterate that I just wish the public had an opportunity to weigh in before you go to the commission. I wish the public had an opportunity to know what's going on. I think that's important, and I think that's that's a real missing link here, because you're the only guy in t you're the only game in town. You know, you got to get your water from Aquarian. If it's I'm with some other company that switches, I can then maybe go to somebody else. And, and say, I don't want to do monthly, I want to do quarterly still and go to somebody else, whereas you guys, I have to stay with you. So if you make that decision, or if the, the commission gives you that a, appropriate, it, we could, you can do it, and I'm stuck. And I would like to have that information prior to it happening. That's, that's my only opinion. And Thanks. I'd like to say that I wish that we knew how much you charge a month if they call up and do it over the phone, because if I was to pay my car payment and they charge $12, uh, I would have to pay $12 each month, where presently, if you did the same thing, I would only have to pay it once every three months. It would be a big difference between $12 and $36. Mm -hmm. so. We could put together a list of... We'll get an answer. Yep. Back to you. Mm -hmm. Usually I don't care how long I pay, make the water company wait, so I just send a check. <laughs> <laughs> what were you going to say? I have another one if you don't. Yes. That one I don't no, so, go so I. Okay, good. Yeah. You want to go first? All right. Uh, on your working capital adjustment that you're going to wait for the next rate adjustment, whenever that takes place, is that 23169 a one-time adjustment? Is that just the amount of money you're going to recover, or does the 23169 go into the rate base, which means it's recovered every time the rate's built? It's an annual deferral, and what is going to happen is it will be amortized over a set time period. So it's it's not it's not set within a in rate base where it continues on. It, it will have a shelf life. Now that's what we we're told about Wicca, and that has a that has a million year shelf life. So, um, yeah, because the way the PUC has designed the rate structure, it's in the structure. Unless you go back and ask them to remove it, it's going to be billed forever. And that's my concern: is that when you get there, you need to put some provision in the rate. That says you're going to collect twenty three thousand one hundred and sixty nine dollars and nothing else for that particular charge over this very specific period of time. And I, I, is it annual? Is it biannual? Is it every ten years? Is it is this an ongoing charge forever, um, or is it just a one time make up because of your working capital adjustment? If it is a one time make up, then that should be on the rate base, so that it shouldn't be charged more than year one. You probably can't answer that right now. Because I, 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 re I, am, I really can't because that would be determined how <coughs> PUC wants to allocate that. Um, and I don't know what we would, how we would tr tr treat that. Right now, it's being deferred on an annual basis. And um, I, I can't even give you an assessment of what we may consider what would be the best option. Okay. It sounds like if it's being deferred until you have your next rate increase, yeah, the, that's an annual expense. So therefore, it's going to go into the rate base. It can't be any other place. It's, if it's an annual expense, it's going to be in the rate base because it's going to be continuing in future years. It equalizes the rate. Well, you can put it in a rate base or you can put it in as an expense. You can amortize it over time and not have it be reflected in your rate base. But that, that really depends on how the PUC wants to treat this particular item. I'm just concerned they're going to treat, treat it like the wicked charge because that just goes on forever. It's part of the rate base forever until, you, until somebody goes back to the PUC and amends it, which hasn't happened. So um, we'll see what happens when it's filed, I guess. Mr. Gerald. Yes. Uh, Carl, you were talking about how going from... Uh, in advance to in arrears, which 
shows people the bill of their actual usage, can promote knowledge of any uh, leaks like Mr. Waddell experienced. Hmm. Um, however, how does that work when you're talking seasonal customers who are still going to be billed in advance? Are they going to get a monthly statement of their actual usage nonetheless? They're actually, the, the uh, service charges for seasonals go out May 1 every year. So most of it is, is in advance because the majority of them go in after that date, but some go in before that date. Some of them actually carry over from the previous year. So the service charge is once a year, regardless of when the meter's put in and how long it stays in. It's the biometric part of it that then gets billed monthly. As long as that meter's active, we get a monthly reading, then, they, then a bill is issued. Okay, so can you just differentiate for us the difference between in your what your petition means for service charge versus volumetric? Well, there are the two parts of the bill. The service charge is supposed to represent the fixed part of the business. It doesn't quite match up exactly. Um, and that's, that's based on the size of the meter. Um, it's, it's essentially a flat rate every month as long as the meter is the same size. And the volumetric is the, is the variable part uh, based on the actual consumption reading. And so this, this change from uh, quarterly to monthly only affects the service charge portion? Correct. No. The, no. Uh, no. Basically, every month you get one-third of what your quarterly service charge was, and then whatever the, the volumetric portion is in that monthly period. So in theory, everything else being equal, it would be a third of what your normal quarterly bill is. You're just getting it once a month. Okay, so the, uh, the seasonal customer will have that ability to monitor usage? Yes. That was one of the reasons that we implemented that for seasonal customers a few years back. I'm sorry, I got a little different answer at the end of the table. Can you just explain that for me? Um, about what? About, you had said correct in answer to my question, and Carl, I think, said something different. Which question was that? Th that the effect of going from monthly to quarterly to monthly only affects the, the service charge, not the volumetric. <laughs> In regards to our filing here, uh, the service charge is what, what essentially what is being impacted here in this petition. It is the usage is, is whether we bill you quarterly or, or, or monthly, you're being billed. My understanding what you're asking for was, you know, your our service charge is being billed in advance in a, in advance period to in, in, in arrears. My understanding was that you were saying that uh, we were changing our service charge to be in line with in arrears. And that's the same thing for our usage. Our usage is already being billed in arrears. So that's, I kind of had a misunderstanding of what you, you were asking. Okay, so that's true for all customers other than public fire? That the service charge we build in, in arrears? That volumetric. Biometric is built in arrears? Uh, Yes, we do bill our biometric in arrears. For even for uh, private fire, which is like for those in condominium associations who are who have uh, uh, you know those uh, water systems that aren't based on usage, but rather the availability of water. A fire fire doesn't not build uh, usage. Sprinkler systems, for instance. Right not billed on the basis of usage. So is there a change to how they will be billed for those who have condominium associations who have sprinklers? Um, I'm not sure how the answer is, except that private fire will be billed similar to our meter customers where their service charge will go from quarterly to monthly and from an advance to in arrears. Okay, now we're going to open it to the public. Anyone wishing to speak from the public? You should stay in case yeah. there's questions. Yeah, we have to stay. Yeah, they'll come to the podium. Anyone wanting to speak for the public? Come on, gentlemen, s sir. Good evening. My name is Bob Ladman. I'm co-chair of the Northampton Water Commission. 
Uh, as was said, we are in favor of, the, of it, and we've been urging it for years uh, because of the savings. And my understanding is that the, the, the cost won't be greater. That uh, We had a, a, our library had a $200 water bill when it had a bad toilet. Uh, and those kinds of things happen. Uh, and that's, that's our primary reason. The other reason is conservation. We've been pushing conservation for years uh, because people just water their lawns freely. Uh, you know we've had arguments with the water company about where they're searching for wells. A lot of the wells are in our town, and we're trying to conserve uh, the water. Uh, a lot of our, we have a Coakley Superfund, and there are areas where we have a lot of water, but we also have water that can't be drawn, and we've gotten into fights with the Bass Water Company over uh, trying to use, uh, for example, the Hobbs Well, um, which, is, which would have drawn on the, uh, on the Coakley and we would have had contaminated water. And after listening to what Flint, Michigan's going on, going on about, we're very concerned about contaminated water. Uh, and this water's good. Uh, and they do. I've been I've been to their facility and seen what they do, and they actually do a good job. They do a much better job than the previous company did. Um, but the meter, the electronic meter reading. Uh, I'm formerly in the electric utility business. In fact, I am still. But I worked for electric utility. Um, and automated reader reading is a very good idea. It, it really helps the company get a better control over their uh, their resources. So happy to answer any questions you, that you've got, but but we're unanimous on it. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak from the public? Mr. Rhinos. Hi, my name is Regina Barnes, 95 Presidential Circle. And I think that maybe what the water company is suggesting could possibly be a good idea and might be able to benefit the town of Hampton. But I think at the same time, there's a lot of questions raised tonight that need to be addressed before a decision should be made on it. And I also strongly agree that the public should be informed and notified of this because I don't think it's fair that the only water company in town go through and make all these changes. I think it's going to be very confusing to a lot of residents of Hampton. And that's all I have to say. Thank, Thank you. Good evening. Hi. Helena Barthel, 33 Dover Avenue, Hampton. Um, first, I'd like to say that I've had several first-hand experiences with Aquarian and their customer service has always been wonderful for me. And they do do a, a good job. But I am very concerned about my bill going up and the bills of all the ratepayers going up. And so I personally am against the switch to monthly billing um, and in the arrears. Uh, it's, as I understand it, uh, there are several advantages for finding leaks sooner, but I, I did a survey of the people on my street and other people that I met with yesterday, and unanimously, everyone thought it would be a real pain to have monthly billing and to now have to pay a bill once a month. Um, the uh, documentation that Aquarian, that was on the Town of Hampton website, says that the rates won't go up. However, I believe the rates aren't going up because the rates are the rates until the next rate case. And I am worried that this will make the, the rates go up in the next rate case. Um, as uh, from my math, the basis points translate into percentages. So right now, uh, it, it's going to be the working capital is 6.83% and it's revised to be 14.53%. So that's about a 7.7% increase. And then, so their numbers show that's 228,000, roughly. And their pre-tax return is 10.15%, and there's the 23,000. So will they be recovering the 23,000? I think was a very valid question. Is this in their in perpetuity? Will they be looking to recover the 228,000, not just the 10% that they're losing on the rate now? When, and then when you add the increased cost, and there will be some increased cost to send out bills, to process bills, monthly instead of quarterly, you know, it could be a quarter of a million dollars extra that the ratepayers will be asked to pay, even if it's not in perpetuity, with being somehow into a rate case. Um, and, and I just don't feel it translates to lower rates for um, the users. So 
Uh, and, and I think the, um, the information doesn't really clearly spell out how will the rates increase for the average customer. There are a lot of intangible, yes, you'll see your conservation, you'll be able to control things, but the bottom line for me is what am I going to be paying every month? And, and I feel that uh, switching to monthly means that we'll have higher rates. And we're not sure how much those rates will be until the next rate case. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the public wishing to speak? Good evening. Brian Lapham, 27 I Street. Um, I have a couple questions. Was the hydrology test done? The hydrology test? Yes. Because I'm referring to the Hampstead case when that was requested before this began. I'm still not sure what you're referring to. Okay, I can show you to, or I can send it to you. Yeah, sure. As to where Give me a call. that came from. Um, the other thing was um, in the Hampstead case, there was a 6% increase for the first year, and the first year is a test study. <coughs> So are you not adding on anything on the first year to test this? Are you referring to the equipment? Equipment? How it goes for equipment or the cost of changing to monthly? Well, the uh, well, the, the monthly is not going to change any of those those figures. It's just changing the cycle when we send bills and, and customers. Right. Well, what they were doing is charging for the billing changes to go to monthly. Uh, there is some cost to make that conversion. Yeah. Okay. So what's that cost? Um, I'd have to look it up. So, so there is a cost to making the change. Um, currently now, how much working capital do you have? Roughly. It's about 200000 Page two. Um, one reason to do this is um, reduce expenses or costs with collections and controls. Um, and find you know and find leaks and things like this. Is this going on now? I I am not so sure how this is going to change going to monthly billing. Yeah. Well, uh, our hope is, is that with lower monthly bills will allow customers uh, to keep current with their bills, which will reduce the number of past due bills, which reduces the effort we have to put into sending notices, tagging uh, customers who are behind, actually going out to enforce shutoffs. Um, there's quite a bit of effort that goes into that. So if it makes it easier for the customer to keep current. Um, it's less, uh, less effort on our part and hopefully less less of an anxiety for them as well. Okay, and my second to last question is the company seeks to promote, I'm on page four, the company seeks to promote conservation resulting from more frequent price signals by implementing monthly, monthly billing in time for summer usage. I don't understand this. How is it gonna conserve monthly Q Usage. Basically, if people get more frequent information on how much water they're actually using, especially during high period, uh, high demand period, like right. when it's hot, if they're watering their lawn, um, it, it may just help them steward that resource better uh, by knowing that it's what it's costing them on a, on a shorter time frame. So you can adjust your costs. Uh, no, it's it's mainly to uh, it, it's going to help them save costs because. They only, if the meter is red late summer, they've been running the water freely on their grass all summer, and then they get hit with a big bill because I didn't realize it was going to be this high and it's going to cost this much. They get that bill in June, they start getting an idea how much it is. They can choose to cut back if they want to, so to save water, potentially save them uh, their cost as well. Just better information so that you can make better use of the resource. 
Okay, I can get that one. And my last one is, can you ought to still go quarterly? Uh, or you will have to go monthly? It's all or nothing. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak from the public? I'll just bring it back to the board one last time. I would just like to say that I agree exactly with what Helena said. That's exactly how I feel about it. Mr. Waddell? All set. Mr. Bridal? I'm all set. Again, I encourage to have a dialogue with the, with the public, your, your, your consumers. <clears throat> I'm not one of them. I live in Hampton, but as he knows, I'm going to keep saying I want to see water on the Western 95. Uh, but. Uh, I think the, the people that use your service should have a right to at least voice their concern. Thank you. Mr. Bean. Thank you for coming up. Appreciate you being able to speak in Hampton. Thanks so much. Thank you for coming in tonight. Uh, I did want to mention that the uh, I have communicated to the Public Utilities Commission that uh, this board would be conducting this public hearing this evening, and I believe uh, I had asked the commission to hold off on making any sort of ruling until we were able to give our feedback. Uh, there are times when the Commission uh, acts first and asks for comments afterwards. Um, I think the Board can consider and perhaps uh, make a decision next week, if you'd like, how to respond to that approach, whether or not to suggest instead of that approach to uh, conducting a, uh, a public comment period uh, in advance of any such ruling. That's a possible. Yeah. And the public hearing is closed. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. To Moving on to public comment. Anyone wishing to make public comment? No one? Okay. Thank you for coming in tonight. Um, announcements and community calendar. I just wanted to say that um, Mrs. Wolseley, Selectman Wolseley, has uh, had a fall and she's in the hospital and we really don't know a lot about it. But did you have anything you wanted to say about that, Fred? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I was told this morning that she had fallen. And um, the information I received was she has a possible broken wrist and some fractures in her heel, uh, which can be quite painful. So she is cur currently confined to the hospital in Exeter, and um, that's all we really know. And we hope everyone can keep her, um, keep their thoughts with Mrs. Wellesley. Mr. Waddell. Yeah, I, um, to, to Mrs. Wellesley, I hope she gets better soon and uh, feels good and heals and comes back because it'll make uh, the chairman's job a lot easier if she's not here so he's waiting for her to get back <laughs> also i want to just say to the public that in a couple of weeks we're going to have our uh, town meeting our election our uh, all the warren articles and i just hope people take the time to read the warren articles to look at the candidates and to make an intelligent decision on how they want to operate mr bridal yes uh send our best wishes again to Mary Louise uh, and as Jim said we do have elections coming up in a couple weeks you will start to see signs around town voting uh, supporting different articles uh, do your homework check them out uh, there was a um, piece in the paper today uh, Friday about a certain off colored sheet that's coming out next week I encourage everybody to to do their own homework, be be a educated voter, look and see what it has to say, and then make up your own mind. Thank you. Mr. Bean. Yeah, we wish uh, Mary Louise a speedy recovery, and uh, that's all I have. Thank you, sir. Moving on to the consent agenda. Number one is veterans tax credits. Two is veteran tax credits. Three is New Hampshire Cemetery deed, and four is use of town property for the Garden Club. Motion to accept the consent agenda. Second. All, all those, it's four to one. 
Next, we have appointments. Mr. Jacobs, Director of Public Works, and is Jen with you? Yeah, she's yes. sitting behind the chair. Four zero on that vote, Mr. Chair. Four zero. <clears throat> Good evening. Um, I was asked to come and give some uh, updates to the, some of the major things we have going on within the department. Uh, one of them occurred today and one of them occurred the first week of February. Uh, force main repairs for the Church Street pump station. Uh, we did meet last uh, Thursday with um, our wetland scientists um, and we have had three different, we have three separate contractors uh, each handling a certain part of the project meet us out at Church Street and we actually walked out to where the we detected the leak in the marsh. Um, we gave them, hopefully one, we gave them one week, which would be this Thursday or Friday morning, to come back with what they thought their relative costs were, uh, respective parts. The three construction firms that we had out there, one is a firm that specializes in wetlands work, uh, accessing the marsh, restoring the marsh when we're done. Um, we hired out or talked to another contractor uh, who's uh, well versed in the pipe repair because the people that wanted to preserve the marsh are not as well versed in that. And the third con contract that we had at the site was uh, um, a contractor that has barges, has the ability to crane or, or convey some of the materials out there. For instance, if we needed uh, uh, a truckload of uh, crushed stone or pea stone up the site to stabilize something, it'd be very difficult trying to get it across the marsh one pail at a time. So one of the things that's being considered is uh, getting it out to the site with a, uh, by uh, using a barge. Um, our basic options that we're looking at at this time is one, to repair the existing force main. Uh, the second would be to then inspect the force main to determine if there's other defects in the pipe. We're trying to do, get a handle on whether this is an isolated one location uh, issue or if there's other potential cracks within the pipe. Or has it um, been scoured thin on the inside? This is what we're trying to uh, come up with. We've also got an engineering consultant uh, working on uh, price to basically slip line the existing force mains. Essentially, it's putting a pipe within a pipe. One option would actually break the pipe in the ground. Uh, it's called uh, pipe bursting. You actually make the, the hole bigger, and then so that the pipe that you sleeve down behind it uh, gives you the same capacity. Um, another option that we're looking at is where they literally just line the inside of the metal pipe but we end up with a slightly smaller uh, pipe. Um, another option that we're looking at is to drill another horizontal bore uh, right underneath the marsh and then uh, pull a new pipe in behind that. Basically what they do is they, instead of boring vertically, they bore horizontally and start down and literally guide the bore. Uh, we start out with a two-inch pilot hole and then they continually expand it to the point that we could literally pull a, uh, a new pipe right through that same hole um, that's typically done in the gas business uh, and in some cases the water industry but uh, sewer it's not a it's not something that's done every day um, an option that uh, it's on the table but uh, we'll just look at it price wise is to open cut another trench through the marsh and install another pipe like they did in 1987 although I can't say I'm as excited about that option as I would be some of the others for environmental and, and cost reasons. <coughs> and then another option that we're looking at is to install a new force main along Church Street up Route 101 and tie into our the existing gravity line that we have at Tide Mill Road. We'd basically be coming down a right-of-way that we have uh, on the west side of the St. James. St. James, thank you. I want to say Moses Paul because that's my father-in-law was a... That's why. Um, some of these are short-term solutions. Some of these are long-term solutions. Um, we don't really have cost values for all these options yet. It'll take about a, 
another week. Uh, when we do have, we'd expect to come back to the board uh, to discuss those options, um, the pluses, the minuses, and the, and the costs. Um, time frame, I'm sure everyone wants to know when we'd have it done. Um, if we just go out to dig up the leak, um, the leak area, it would take about a week in the field, and we've looked at the time schedule, and the contractors could get it done in March. If we go with a longer-term solution, um, it, it could be designed and permitted this spring, uh, bid it out in the summer, and installed late in the summer to early fall, depending upon what we uh, what we could work out with you for funding. Um, so those that's the, the kind of time schedule that we're looking at. Questions? Questions, Mr. Waddell? Uh, rely on your expertise. It, it really sounds like you're doing a, a good job. Sounds like you get everybody involved that needs to be involved. And I'm, I'm sure that that whatever uh, you come up with for a plan is going to be a plan that's going to last for a while. I mean, you've talked about that. You know about that. And uh, yeah, I await the costs and everything and see what happens. But I, I, I full trust in what you're doing. Mr. Bridal. You guys are the people that we depend on to know what we're doing. Uh, I trust you'll come back with what's the most efficient, most cost-effective, <coughs> longest-lasting plan we can have. Thank you. Mr. Bean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Your predecessor came into uh, the uh, Exeter Road project with a $5.8 million um, deal, presented it to the board. What do you uh, pave that road for? We spent a total of six hundred on it. Six hundred thousand, a little bit of a difference. Um, and going forward with this uh, this uh, phenomena, uh, you guys did a remarkable job, both of you, and Mr. Welch did, and, and the chairman did, in uh, calling an emergency meeting. And this, of course, is um, one of two pipes that takes raw effluent from the beach and gets it to our sewer system. Correct. Correct. So this is perhaps the greatest uh, strategic infrastructure. Uh, system that the town has. Would you agree? I would agree. And so, uh, in, as, as we look at it, um, I think it needs close supervision from Mr. Welch. Of course, you're going to be integrating vertically with the state and federal authorities. Uh, it calls into account uh, what our agreements are, and specifically if they address maintenance uh, uh, expenditures with uh, Rye or other towns. The state has facilities that uh, pump into this. Uh, we're looking for uh, money to assist the town, to uh, assist the state, mm -hmm. to assist Northampton, to assist Rye in their uh, disposal of effluent. And I think that's the proper alignment of our attitude as we go forward. I am looking uh, at two pipes that uh, support sometimes hundreds of thousands of people on a weekend. If that goes south, uh, that is a, uh, a problem where the beach would be shut down. Uh, it is a problem with real estate values, it's a problem with business values, it's a problem with uh, business owners at the beach, and if it goes south on our watch, uh, um, it's something that perhaps would take years to recover from. So again, you've done a great job. I would, uh, I would like to hear, uh, in, and I know that Mr. Welch is, is on top of this, and I know you are, but alternatives to a, a pipe uh, route selection that do not go underneath the marsh that uh, are more uh, solid land-based. Yeah. And additionally, that second pipe, uh, what is the status of that? We can uh, you know, do potholes, we can patch tires, but uh, on those two pipes, I think we need uh, an expansive, exhausted, exhaustive uh, examination of both of those critical uh, infrastructure pieces and to assess those and not think this year, next year, but to think 50 years in the future get current, uh, again, bring in other people that participate um, with the town to include Rye and Northampton and the state, see what they're going to pony up, re-examine our, our, uh, our contracts with those towns and those government entities that use that. Uh, we just came up with Gatsby, the depreciation on our uh, physical assets. Finance director did a great job. This is a core example of uh, that depreciation expense that is captured, and it's millions of dollars a year. It speaks to our relationship with the state, mm -hmm. and uh, you can see how it all comes and starts to make sense. So I have full confidence in you, but those will be, I think, the questions coming from higher headquarters. Those will be questions coming from people who have their, their very uh, business lives, uh, their, their, uh, their investments, 
the most important investments in their property and billions of dollars of uh, value at the beach. And uh, let's get it right and let's be aggressive. I would agree. Thank you. Yeah, I would just like to say that uh, what's most important to me is the price, uh, you know, like keep, do everything we can to keep the price down <clears throat> and get the best price that we can and do everything we can to make it uh, what's best for the future. Uh, that alone will keep the price down for what happens in the future. And um, I am, the town of Rye automatically will be paying a certain percentage of this. Right, Mr. Welch? Improvements dealing with the system are prorated. Like 5% yeah. or something uh, like there that? Is a, there is a percentage, but it changes every time we bill it, so. Okay. Um, so it's all determined how much they're supposed to pay. Whether and how much the like cost goes are. wrong. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then the other person that also contributes is the state, not Northampton? That's correct. Yeah. The, the state actually pays Rye, not us. Rye pays us on behalf of both. They're on Rye's line, so they have to contribute so, money to Rye. Rye pays it back to us okay. for that use. So that, you know, that's in addition. So it it it's the percentage is based on what's coming from the Rye sewage line. That's correct. Okay. Would you like to continue? Thank you. Thanks. Um, being that it was a Monday, we also had a sewage main blockage on Route One. Mm -hmm earlier today. Um, this is an area uh, just north of the Dunkin' Donuts, between there and the finesse cleaners. Um, we mobilized staff. Uh, we found out that uh, it was a blockage uh, comprised of mainly grease uh, that had solidified and um, a bunch of rags. Um, we had it open within, I would say, within the hour of knowing what the, what the uh, issue is and um, the main reason I want to bring this one up is that's a portion of the, the sewer pipe um, that is scheduled to be worked on this summer that was when we got through we we're in the budget process and we we're talking and you like one of uh, sewer and drains lines is one hundred and thirty thousand dollars for construction this is where that money was earmarked for uh, this is a, a section of line that we know is our most, other than the force main across the, the marsh, is our most tenuous piece of pipe in the town. Um, matter of fact, it's, uh, it's made of vitrified clay and it was installed in 1934. And if I had to wrap up the, the force main and, and this particular pipe issue, um, it's apparent that what's coming to roost for, for my years here is in keeping um, the maintenance of these long-term or older infrastructure items that were installed. Um, because it's obvious that they're not going to go away. They're going to they're continue to sneak up on us. Uh, we need to be proactive on our um, continued funding to get these things uh, changed over, improved, replaced, upgraded, whatever you want to call them. Um, because if we don't, they're going to slowly bite us in the butt. Uh, if this was a collapsed pipe and we'd had been in the digging mode at the moment, we'd be into an expensive bypass pumping. And this particular line in Lafayette Road is the lifeblood of the downtown area. Everything from uh, where the old salt is south relies on this particular line. So when you say that there's a grease... Uh blockage does that come from any one spot no we find it comes from a lot of spots certainly all the the restaurants that have uh, fry laters or grease traps but even in the residential neighborhoods we see a lot of uh, grease plugs when we're when we're jetting and cleaning those lines uh, so it is coming from the residents um, if they can take the you know bacon fat and if they have a little go daddy or whatever put that stuff into um, coffee cans and and empty soup cans and you know put it in the refrigerator let it solidify we take it down the transfer station no problem um, matter of fact if they wanted to bring us bulk grease in a liquid state we'd even take that at the transfer station we have a me another means of getting rid of it 
but just pouring it down the drain is probably the worst thing to do um, because it causes issues just like this that we saw today. So do restaurants um, dump their grease traps into no, the... No, we have a... We have a, uh, we, have a uh, we call it a fog program, foldables, oils, and grease. Uh, Mr. Aslan goes around twice a year. We do inspections of all the restaurants. They cooperate nicely. Uh, we go over with them how to clean the grease traps, the fact see that they are having the grease traps cleaned out. And uh, so we get a, a lot of good cooperation from the, uh, the restaurants. Uh, I'd be hesitant to, and, uh, to blame it on just the you know, commercial entities. It's not them. It's, it's all of us. We all do it. But it's a practice that needs to cease. Uh, people need to keep, try and keep it out of the waste stream. Um, that and flushing down whole rags uh, just um, boggles the mind because the combination of those two things, it's like uh, mortar and stone. And when it plugs up a line, it really plugs up the line. So the, uh, when we got the, the manhole in front of uh, finesse cleaners finally drained out, on the shelf or the floor of it, there was over a foot of waste, uh, solidified grease that was on the sides of the shelf. They had to be shoveled out. So that's, I mean, that's how significant of a problem it is to us in the plant. Uh, the last thing that I wanted to go over with you is uh, we did meet uh, the first week of February, interviewed four separate engineers for uh, reconstruction of the Mill Pond Dam. This would be the final set of plans that we'd actually go to bid with. Um, based upon those uh, interviews, I uh, gave to uh, the manager a request to uh, basically, if we could, enter into a, a discussion period, a contract negotiation period with the contractor that we, uh, that we shortlisted, and that was PARE, P-A-R-E, Incorporated. Uh, they're going to team up with VHB out of Manchester, and uh, they were seem to be the most experienced, the most uh, thoughtful group. Uh, we'd like to permission to enter into at least a contract negotiation with them. That was it. And I have to say that um, Jennifer's been handling 80% of the phone calls and legwork with respect to this force main issue. She's on the phone daily. Um, constantly with the three different uh, contractors, with our wetland scientists, trying to um, pull this together, pull all these strings together to get us all this information so we can make an educated decision. That's it. Questions? Mr. Waddell? Yeah, thanks, Chris. And, you know, you said it, that that sewer line is the lifeblood of the downtown area. It is. And all of our sewerage and all of our drainage is the lifeblood of the town. And, we, and, you know, you guys are doing a good job, and I, and I think we really, and, and stressing it to the public, that we really have to keep on top of this. We have to keep this infrastructure up. It's not like, well, maybe it might go, so we'll let it go 10 years, and we'll see if it might go. Right. That we really have to stay on top of it and have a plan to, to constantly update this and constantly take care of it, that we don't run into constant, constant yep. problems. So I, I think you're doing a good job, and I think we got to really stay on top of this. Mr. Bridal. First of all, thank you, Jennifer, for keeping us well informed. You've done an excellent job of the, the weekly emails. I think that helps a lot. That alleviates a lot of problems. My question, and I, I'll go back to what Jim had to say, is is that line is as important to the uptown area as this line across the marsh is to the beach? Yes. This is not something that has snuck up on us. They, they've known since 1989 when they camered that line that the line was starting to fail. Mm -hmm. And previous boards have continued to push, push that off and kick that can down the road. Right. We've got to start taking a hard look at some of this stuff. That line is collapsing, and at any minute, it could shut off. Tell me what would happen if we lost that line. Well, we've made friends with a pumping company. <laughs> No, I, th yeah. There's a small we, joke in there, but all this right. communication has really made us put our hats on and go, what are our emergency plans? So right. we've come yeah. up with them. We, I mean, we literally have the equipment, this, this, the skill set to do it. Um, if the temperature stays with us and if this line gets worse, uh, we'd set up, uh, we have a the van set up with the bypass pumps. We literally plug one manhole and 
through a series of pipes laid down the side of the street would pump to the next functioning manhole and then basically cut into the street, dig down. Uh, this particular main's down there about six feet and literally just start to replace every single foot. But it's not something that you can just go down and replace a little piece of. That whole line is pretty well the shot. Whole, the whole line is shot. I mean, we're talking a, it's roughly, everything in that area that needs to be replaced this summer is a $300,000 job. How much money do I have? 130. I'll spend the 130 and get done every foot I can, but I, that'll be a street that I'll need to go back into maybe even next year. And, and, and that should go into next year. And that doesn't include any drainage. That's just right. strictly sewer. Just, just sewer. And the drainage that's down there is in the same rough? It's probably of the same age, right? And, and to be honest with you, we spend all our time videotaping and cleaning sewer lines. We don't spend any time videotaping or inspecting drain lines and, until they plug. And this is just one area of town. around town. We have a lot of pipes that were put in in the 30s, 40s, and 50s that are going to need to work. And due to our lack of, and not lack of caring, but lack of maintenance, we're, we're at this point now that we're going to have to start spending some money in this town, some serious money on upgrades and maintenance of our infrastructure. Right. If not, we're going to run into a lot of problems. And I think it's important there to, you know, even maintenance that's been done well, 1934 pipe, it does get a lifetime. So, it, you know, it, it is a combination of things get old, and that's that investing in infrastructure that you hear everybody talking about, that it's sometimes it is time to replace them. And as I heard today was the fact that we couldn't jet that pipe for fear of we fear that we do more damage. Do to more it. damage to the pipe, so we can't even flush that pipe properly, right. because we're worried about the damage we will cause by flushing it to clean it out, making it whole. So it is a serious situation. Right. Thank you, Mr. Bean. Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, the board uh, speaks to great issues. Mr. Welsh does. You're doing a great job. It's a, a big piece of the pie. It's not just the uh, the two mains from the uh, right. um, from the beach up here. It's all of it. So take a take a good hard look. Get aggressive with it, um, and inform the public, and warn the public, and uh, inform the citizenry. Uh, not so much of spending money, but investing in the town of Hampton, mm -hmm. and investing in in our businesses, and uh, spending money or investing money on ourselves. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, guys. Does the um, the town or the state of New Hampshire planning on getting any money from this three hundred million do billion dollar infrastructure uh, bill at the the Senate voted on. Does that go back to municipalities at all, or is there any hope that that might happen? Well, that would go back through the, you know, it, it gets allocated to the Department of Transportation, and from there, further whittled down to what Hampton's share would be. The lion's share of that federal money um, would go to bridges, bridges, Spalding Turnpike, you know, Route 16, I-95. I mean, they're doing the Taylor River Bridge. They're still completing the the additional work at the General Sullivan Bridge. Um, yeah, th that's predominantly where it gets sucked up, mm -hmm. and we see it back in the, um, Tiger grants for the walking improvements, the trails that they want to want us to adopt. Um, that's where we see it, and and also the bridges. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I the other day we got a uh, notice that the the Neil Underwood Bridge is right there at the top, and it's scheduled for 2017. Mm -hmm. There was a time, though, Mr. Welch, when uh, the communities got some of this money back when they did work like this. The original federal grants were 85% between state and federal for the uh, construction of this equipment, and these pipes and these lines, and particularly for the sewers and the sewer plants, okay. and that has been reduced to zero. So is there any hope that that will ever change or? Only if they decide they can print more money and now they're spending all their printing, so. Uh, no, they've, they've done away with all these grants because they figure they've given us all we need to have and apparently their concern is that nothing ever needs to be replaced. And that's just not the case. So something will change when cities and towns start going bankrupt. Thank you for coming in tonight. We appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Jennifer. Good luck. Have a good night, guys. Stay tough with them when you talk to them. <laughs>
Um, moving next, Charlie Preston. Mm. Beat up on him. Good evening. Good evening. <clears throat> for, um, for those at home, the reason I'm coming to talk to you is about Article 38. And I'm kind of puzzled by this article. Uh, and I'm, I'm kind of puzzled by the selectman's recommendation. Um, <clears throat> I didn't know if I could ask the manager through the chair or if any of the selectmen know. How, what is the square footage that we'd be voting to discontinue? The article says we're voting to discontinue E Street. And I didn't know if anybody had any idea of the square footage of the area we're talking. Would you like to address that? I, I haven't measured it, but it would be exactly the same as D Street and F Street. Okay. They're, they're all the same length and all the same width. Well, on, on the width, I just, for ball, you know, to guess, I, I measured um, D Street, which is the north end of the casino, and it was 28 feet curb to curb. And I mentioned, uh, I measured F Street, which was 24 feet curb to curb. Depends so, on how wide the sidewalks are, and et cetera. I, I, I agree that could be a possibility, Fred. Um, I believe they're 30 foot right of ways. Okay. Is what they are. So then we then we could assume that the E Street is right around 30 foot. That's, I think, a pretty safe assumption. Roughly yeah. 500 feet, so we're talking, yeah. say, at least 15,000 yep. square feet of, of area. Just, just to give people uh, some, you know, a comparison of sorts. The Clues family, which I thought was very generous to the Hampton Beach Village District, sold their property down there. I think it came out to be about 16,000 square feet. So it's, we're, in, we're in the ballpark, yeah? And they sold that, the village, Hampton Beach Village District taxpayers paid the Clues family one million. And when I say the Clues family was generous, they sold that for the assessed value of the property. At the deliberative session on January 30th, Mr. Manager stated in doing our research of these streets, we discovered in 1899, the Hampton Beach Improvement Company deeded over the casino right and title to land except E Street. He stated E Street does exist and we own it. The manager stated, giving this, Passing Article 38 would eliminate a problem. Personally, I don't see a problem, but I see more of an opportunity. Because with the update of the transportation section of the master plan to the tune of 375000 that's going on now, is not the time to turn over any asset of the town of Hampton that could help relieve transportation and parking issues. To date, Upwards of 100,000 has been spent by VHB of that 375,000 overseen by DOT based on two way traffic on Ashworth Ave. After spending since last spring, I'm not sure exactly how many months, they met with police, fire, and public works about two weeks ago after spending six or eight months on it. And while I can't speak for them, I believe they, they agree two way traffic won't work in season. I look at that 100,000 of that 375 as a waste. And I, when I say upwards, I don't have an exact number. I'm, Mr. Nye is working to see if I can get that soon. I firmly believe an entrance to the casino property would help our goals and also benefit the casino properties. For people to be able to access the Hampton Beach Village District, the town of Hampton, and the casino parking lots without driving on Ocean Boulevard or Ashworth Ave is an absolute no-brainer to me. But at the very least, we ought to get the opinions of traffic engineers. I'm, I'm only a layman. The situation has existed for 118 years, and we should not be in a rush to discontinue East Street. The possibilities are endless. Less traffic, bus stop areas, public safety access, the police and fire, the fire department wouldn't have to go northbound on a southbound street. 
pedestrian vehicle conflict. I hope after further review, the Board of Selectmen would change their minds with respect to the recommendation of this Article 138. I realize that stuff's gone to the warrant and it'll come out as that, but in the meantime, before the election, you could say, you know, after further review, maybe we should wait, put this off for another year and make work for, work for the town of Hampton. Let's not give it an asset of Hampton without working to compromise, access, egress, traffic easement, the traffic easements that could be made to, to be enforced during events at the beach. In October 9th, 2012, enhancement not change by Kyle Stuker, who was posted on the Hampton Northampton patch. I believe the owner, the majority owner of the casino properties, Mr. Lupoli, Lupoli was, was quoted in there, and you, you can look that up. But in this article, there's an aerial view. It's a great picture. It shows the new bandstand, it's taken from over the water. It has the casino, encompasses the casino, the casino parking lot, Brown Ave, the police station, and fire station. If you look at this, you can actually see everything and the possibilities. In the video, Mr. Lupoli also states there'll be plenty of opportunity to listen to the people that are stakeholders and are from the community. The Hampton Beach Area Commission has tried numerous times to get Mr. Lupoli with the HBC, and I don't know if this has ever happened. I know Mr. Nyan has tried many times and hadn't had much success. But let's say no to 38, at least this year. It's been 118, we can wait another one. And get all the parties to the table before we give up any asset or leverage. In today's world, planning boards do have some say with respect to assets and egress to <coughs> properties. I'm not quite sure how this came up, but let's not give it out without working the best deal we can get for Hampton taxpayers and visitors of our town. We can make this work for both sides if we work together. While many say the casino is the heart of Hampton Beach, I say the intersection of Brown Ave and East Street and Ashworth can truly be the hub of Hampton Beach. Please join me and vote no on Article 38, March 8th. I'd also like to say, if anybody has any questions or if they'd like to know, I've gone before the, I spoke at the deliberative session, I spoke at the Hampton Beach Village District, the chairman was gracious enough to let me speak tonight, get on the agenda, I was supposed to be two weeks ago, you know, we lost, we lost my mom, and uh, so Christina was gracious enough to reschedule for a couple of weeks, and I'm going to meet with the HPAC, their meeting Thursday has been now changed to March 1st. So I'm hitting everybody, and if, and if anybody at home would like to know how to view those means, I can get you right to them very quick, and you can see, you know, very short what you need to see. Feel free to call me, because I agree with what you said, Rusty. People, you know, need to do their homework, be an educated, be an educated voter, and uh, everybody should keep an open mind, but this is something that should be voted down. And a year from now, after we get sit down with VHB, the HBAC, Casino Projects, because I think we can make this work for everybody. If I own that property, I would more than welcome that entranceway coming in there. I'd have buses coming right to my door. And I think this is something we can make work for everybody. And I'd like to tell anybody, please feel free to call me if they need any explanation or different opinion. And my phone number is 603-235-6118. Two three five six one one eight. Feel free to call me if you guys have any questions on whatever you like. Mr. Waddell, Fred, could you explain uh, the reasoning behind in the town? We have taken on a project over the last few years of trying to identify all the town roads that are customarily maintained by the town or built by the town or built by the Hampton Beach Improvement Company, which is part of the town, founded by the town. Um, we set the beach area, the South South Beach area, uh, as a goal this year to try to get those streets accepted so they would be legal public ways, public highways. Uh, and they're not on the books as legal public highways, they're just there. They are in town property. 
in researching that, and uh, Charlie's right, this goes back to 1898, 1899, it's almost 120 years ago. Um, we looked up the original plans for all those streets and we found them in the registry of deeds we then looked at the um, the deeds that were issued by the hampton beach improvement company on behalf of the town to, to in fact develop that area and what we found was that with regards to the casino property that they were deeded the south side of d street every lot all the way from ashworth avenue up to ocean boulevard they were deeded the frontage from D to E. They were deeded the north side of E Street to Ashworth Avenue. And they were deeded the south side of E Street from Ashworth Avenue to Ocean Boulevard. And then the frontage along Ocean Boulevard to F Street and down the south side of, or the north side of F Street. They were not deeded E Street. It's pretty obvious in, in the deeds. We went through and checked every lot. E Street was not a lot. However, they've been paying taxes on it for almost 120 years. They've developed it. Um, it wouldn't be very kosher as far as a business community is concerned to say, okay, you don't own that anymore. Uh, and if the town votes that, then I'm forced into a position under the law of not being allowed, they can't be allowed to have any building permits, electrical permits. Uh, plumbing permits, they can't do any work on that property, they can't occupy it without coming to the selectmen and getting, um, you have to vote leases for the people that would be in that building because it's at least it's on your property. They would have to pay you to have it on your property. Um, that's a pretty high hurdle. And if you want to connect that to Ocean Boulevard, you're just going to have to cut 30 or 40 feet right off the casino, right through the middle of it, to get access to Ocean Boulevard. Because you can't have it both ways. There are, there's no air rights in the statutes. You can't build on top of that right away. It's just not there. You have to go to the legislature, get special permission to do that. Um, for all intents and purposes, the town has gone along for 120 years and allowed them to use that property. Uh, they need to have a vote to determine whether or not the town is actually going to abandon it and give it to them for the taxes they paid for 120 years and for the investment they've made in the building, which is over the top of that. Uh, if the town says no, it's very clear uh, that in fact, nothing can happen on that property until the town does something again, somehow. Okay, thank you. Uh, Charlie, I've listened to what you've said, listen to what Fred says, and I, and I gotta think. But I understand your point, I understand Fred's point. How does it go uh, when you hear, and I can remember um, that there's been areas where people have been mowing um, the lawn and taking care of it, and all of a sudden the land reverts to the people that were mowing and maintaining the land. There were some cases of this along Exeter Road. Only if the town consents to it. There is, it, New Hampshire, unlike, New Hampshire has, an, has a law, we don't have a land court. If you occupy a municipal property, you can't squat on it and claim it. The town has to give it up to you. So you can never acquire property by adverse possession. It's not legal in New Hampshire. So you either have to give the property up or you have to exert your right to it and kick the people off that are currently occupying it. The town needs to make its mind up one way or the other in order to accomplish and move forward to clarify the situation. Now. We unfortunately only get the opportunity to do this once a year. I know that Mr. Napoli is, is um, thinking about developing that property, and he has, and I've talked to him, and that's one of the things he wants to do is put an intersection there, and I think the planning board wants to have an intersection there at Ashworth Avenue off of his property, and they want it traffic controlled. Um, but I would have to tell you that if I was Mr. Napoli and, and someone came to me and said, no, sorry, you can't use that property anymore. You have to stay off it because it's town property and that's the law until a town meeting makes a further vote. I wouldn't do that at all. And people from Massachusetts probably wouldn't because that's not the way they do business. And knowing Sal the way I do, uh, I think he'd probably give us anything we want. But to take the property this way is probably not something that's very friendly from a business standpoint. So. When I look at it, 
give the town an opportunity to vote to see what they want to do. Uh, 118 years worth of paid taxes on the property is a lot of money, not to mention the investment he's made. And it's a lot more than we would get if we sold him the road at the prices that were quoted. We're talking millions and millions of dollars investment there in taxes and property. It just doesn't make a lot of sense if you're going to be a business friendly community. That's the basis upon which we put the article in. I think that's the basis upon which the town has to make a decision. If, if your house, for instance, were accidentally on town property and the town came along and said, sorry, Charlie, we're tearing it down, you gotta go. It's our house. That wouldn't be fair. You're doing the same thing here, basically. You're taking away someone's vested right that they've paid for for over 100 years. They can't legally have it unless we give it to them. But in essence, you're, you're taking away their 118-year their investment in one fell swoop. Mr. Bridal. The only part I, I, I understand what Charlie's saying, I understand the importance of having that as a entrance to the casino. I've worked there, down that area for a long time. Um, but E Street, as a street, has never been there. Hmm. The, it's a paper. It's a paper street. It's just like a little street we used to call Rye Court down in Surfside Park. That was never there, and now there's a house right where it was. Um, but they have been paying taxes on it for 118 years. They have made improvements to that piece of property. Uh, that street was never put in, and for the past 118 years, there's never been any intent for that street to be put in there. And I think that uh, to tell, tell the, the, that property now that they can't use that and they can't do anything to it and hinder any uh, future development of that until it's approved by the town, I think the town, to move forward, we need to go ahead with this vote and, and clear that up. I, I hear what Charlie's saying. I'm also sure that the property owner hears what Charlie's saying, what the people are interested in. Um, and as the town manager said, uh, he's, uh, he's talked to uh, the gentleman and he's interested in putting an intersection there, which I think is what we all want to see as far as an entrance to the way, and I agree with you. It would be great to have an entrance there to go into the casino or the fire department or the police department or anybody, but to go into that property so they don't have to go north, northbound in the southbound traffic. So uh, although I can sympathize with you, Charlie, I think it's what we ultimately what we, we should do. And if we, can, if we can have conversation with the property owner to make sure that what you want to see get done, all the better. Mr. Bean. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie, for coming in. And, and always your stewardship and active uh, citizenship. Really appreciate it. Heard what you had to say. Uh, I'm enthusiastic in support of how the board has voted on this and our recommendation at, uh, at the uh, deliberative. And uh, I haven't changed my mind. I won't change my mind. Uh, it uh, um, is what it is. And if we were to uh, pursue uh, any other course of action, um, uh, I think it will be a, a tort nightmare. Uh, as we go forward and ultimately uh, the citizens of this town are the uh, decision makers and it's before them now but uh, I am not ambivalent and I'm not reticent I'm very confident that that is the uh, proper way forward for Hampton and thank you very much thank you sir and so is this something that Mr. Lapoli has to straighten out before he can do anything there he has a lien against his title there's a defect in it because he's built over someone else's property and yes, he's going to have to straighten it out one way or the other. And it either requires a town vote to give him the property based on what he's done in the past or what the, what the property owners have done in the past, or to take it away. So did he know that when he bought the business? I don't believe knowing? anybody knew it because I don't think anybody has read that deed in 118 years. So how did it all come up? It all came up because we were trying to accept those streets. And as we were doing our due diligence and going through and finding out where the streets were and the deeds associated with them, this cropped up. So there needs to be some effort to correct it in some fashion. Yeah, Charlie? Mr. Chairman, I, I 
I thank you all for your comments. <coughs> I, I, res I respectfully disagree. I did go to the HBAC in October 2012 to ask about this entrance being put in there. I think they approached them. I have no idea if that's how it came up. Yeah, but, and I think he said no, didn't he? I, I don't know. Or didn't answer it. I don't know. He has, he's never come to the HBAC meetings. I know you're on that board, and, and he's been asked over the phone through letters and everything, but, you know, we, one person, you know, Rusty said, it, you know, that it's never been there, but the town manager says it is there, and we own it. I'd like to state this is not a land grab. We're not looking to take the land, the building, or the land, say you can't use it. We're looking at this is property that we own, and we need to take leverage. If Mr. Le if if this article passed, and Mr. Lapoli took property of it, he could do what he wanted, not do anything with us. He could just say he could promise you something, but once this goes, he could do anything. I just think it's something that we should definitely not do. I, I realize, Fred, you say they've paid taxes for 118 years. Well, a few years ago, and this is all public information. I got an abatement on my taxes. The Glade Path, 47 Glade Paths, my address. They had me assessed to 218. It got reduced to 200. The reason it did was they had me listed as a three-bedroom house. I have a bedroom. I let them in. I'll let anybody in. Okay? But I couldn't go back and get any tax money. As I said to him, I said, well, how about all those years that I was taxed a three-bedroom? Doesn't matter. That's gone. That's history. So it, it doesn't just happen to some people. It happened to me, too. And you know what? It's my own fault that I wasn't on top of it to find that my house was listed as a three-bedroom. How they ever got that information? Maybe it was just at a time when you know, they couldn't get into something, and they just measured it and assumed it was a three-bedroom. But that's why I was giving the abatement. The assessor came right in here and said, yeah, Charlie only has a one. I let him in. I let the, the assessor and his assistant came in. You know, this is an adverse possession. Because obviously it doesn't exist because of a you know municipality New Hampshire law. It's a good thing we got that New Hampshire law in my book. You know, and you know when you're talking about we're taking property, you, know, you can't take your own property. It's ours. Mm -hmm. All I'm saying is let's get the man to the table first, because if this passes, you lose all rights. Mm -hmm. And like I said, if if we're if we're ballparking, this is fifteen thousand square feet. The village district just paid a million to close. This isn't about money. This isn't about taking the land. It's our land. You can't take your own land. This is about working the best deal for the town of Hampton taxpayers with respect to public transportation and parking updates. We know we're spending $375,000. As far as I'm concerned, VHB has wasted 100 to date. Okay, we've heard your comments. Mr. Gerald, do you have anything? Nothing on this one. Thank no. you. Okay, thank you for coming in tonight. Thank you very much for your time. We appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, Charlie. Thanks, Charlie. Um, moving on to the approval of minutes, February 1st, 2016. Motion to approve. Second. All those in favor? Unanimous. Number two is February 3rd, 2016. Motion to approve. Second. All those in favor? Unanimous. Number three is February 10th, 2016. February 10th of February. Okay. February 10th, 10th. Oh, 10th, that's right. Motion to approve. Second. All those in favor? Unanimous. Next, we have the town manager's report. Mr. Welch. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, I just want to remind people if they're eligible for either the veterans, the blind, the elderly, or the disabled exemptions, they should be taking applications at the assessor's office. The finished application has to be filed not late in April 15, 2016. If you're eligible for property tax abatement, the application must be filed by March 1, 2016 with the assessor's office. And there, there's paperwork at the assessor's office for all of this material that needs to be filled out. If you are eligible for an exemption for residential property taxes from the Hampton Beach Village District tax, the application must be filed by April 15, 2015. Please go to the assessor's office and pick up the necessary forms. We're just the sort of the agent for the district, uh, for the precinct, and we, you fill them out, you return them to us, and we make sure the precinct gets them and acts upon them. 
Uh, please remember that the town election and meeting are on March 8, 2016. If you need an absentee ballot, you must contact the town clerk's office. Voting will be at the Winnicott High School cafeteria from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Work continues on the broken sewer pipe, as you heard this evening, at Church Street Station. We're going to continue the evaluation process to determine the, the processes necessary to complete the repairs for the replacement of the portion that is damaged or for a new pipe. Don't know the answer to that question as of yet, Mr. Chairman. That's it, sir. So, if <clears throat> the elderly disabled exemptions, are those for only for elderly that are disabled or they're for people of limited funds? There, there are two types. There, there, two there is an elderly ones. and there is a disabled. There is also a blind and the veterans. Mm -hmm. uh, they're all separate. They, they, you could actually end up with all five, theoretically. So if they had them last year, do they have to apply for them again? They do not. Uh, once every five years, they have to bring information in to renew them. But we have new people moving into town all the time. And they may be eligible for these exemptions. Uh, and they need to go to the assessor's office to, to learn whether they are or are not. So what would happen if this was the fifth year? The assessor's office would send you a notice and get you requalified for the exemption. They would have done that? They would have done that. Okay. Yes. Questions? Mr. Bridal? All set. Thank you. Mr. Bean? Mr. <clears throat> Waddell? Set. Thank you for your report. Thank you, Mr. Welch. Uh, old business. Mr. Waddell? Nope. Mr. Nothing. Bridal? Mr. Bean? New business, Mr. Waddell, Mr. Bridal, Mr. Bain. Yeah, I would have to say that we kind of beat everything to death tonight on our own. <laughs> <laughs> um, next, we're going to have a non-public session under RSA 91-A colon 3. Uh, that would be also, Mr. Chairman, if we could have a a motion uh, to go into a non-public session, <laughs> which would require a roll call under uh, RSA 91 hyphen capital A colon three colon two small d. Make Closing. that motion. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. Yes, no. And uh, yes. roll call. Aye. 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 A I I I thank you and closing comments I'd like to say Mrs. Wolsey would be proud of us that we beat everything to death <laughs> she would <laughs> <laughs> Mr. any other closing comments is there a motion motion to adjourn all those in favor unanimous thank you thanks